Um, I wanted to start out by um, by talking about Brownian motion. We're, we're basically where we are in the course is at a critical moment. It's it's the weak point of the course because up until now you've heard from Steve and others, uh, Steve and Adam and uh, Mike Whitlock, about quantitative characters evolving within natural populations. And now we get beyond the, the boundary of the, of the species and we start talking about multiple species. And when you talk about multiple species, when I was a, when I was a graduate student in the mid-60s, we were, I was in theoretical population genetics. We had all this wonderful theory. We had very little data, but it started to arrive. But whenever we looked beyond the species boundary, there were deep terrors. There were monsters out there. We didn't really know how to take any of this stuff and say anything about other species. And I got, as a graduate student, I got interested as a side light in, sideline in, in phylogenies. And I started getting involved with them. And in the end, when my main thesis topic uh, came up empty, and I had no, no sensible results, Dick Lewinton said to me, uh, my advisor said to me, uh, well, why don't you write up that tree stuff? And so I did. And it took a long time. It wasn't for another 10 years or 15 years almost that I began to realize that um, I had been working in phylogies, but I began to realize that, that this was not only fun and interesting, but it was somehow going to be central to looking at data uh, across multiple species. And that, in a sense, this, this one of the secret keys to working on multiple species was that you couldn't take a group of 20 species and look at them without sensibly, without first trying to find out something about phylogenies and to think about mechanisms of change along phylogenies. They're, Phylogenies and related diagrams involving hybridization and other, other non-tree-like things are the central structure that you use to look at multiple species data. So we're at the point of moving this course into that area, looking at multiple species. And in doing so, we see changes along lineages. And the question is, are those changes along lineages reasonably extrapolated from the processes that we've been talking about within species. So we have the material on within species. We have um, models using statistical models such as Brownian motion between species. The question is, do those make contact? Or do we have to somehow have some different body of theory or some different set of processes uh, in order to explain where the Brownian motion came from? Right now, we're going to treat it as the result of processes such as genetic drift. I'll be getting a little more, more into this. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about the within-species processes and the, the long-term changes that they would result in and how one could statistically model that. And central to that is Brownian motion. Um, Brownian motion is... Uh, of course, random jiggling of molecules, um, and it was discovered by Robert Brown in the 1820s. And the interesting thing I found out is that Robert Brown was a botanist. He was not a physicist or a mathematician. He was an expert in microscopy. He's the one who, who he first, he's the first person to make the distinction between the monocots and the dicots. He also discovered, he's the major discoverer of the cell nucleus, so incredibly important work. When Charles Darwin went on his um, voyage on the Beagle, before he went, he consulted with Robert Brown about what type of microscopes to take along. Bra Brown's uh, own microscope, which was used to discover Brownian motion in the 1820s, by the way, is on display in a display case in the lobby of the Linnaean Society in London. And someone recently borrowed it with their permission and used it to replicate his findings and find that, yes, this tiny little microscope uh, can see Brownian motion. Um, I'll just say one more thing about Robert Brown. He became the secretary of the Linnaean Society, had a long career. Um, in 1858, he died. 
they had to have a special meeting of the Linnaean Society to elect a successor. And that was the meeting that was available for reading the papers by Wallace and Darwin in 1858. And people always wonder why there was so little reaction to the Wallace and Darwin papers. Apparently it was an incredibly long meeting full of society business. At the very end, these people got up and droned away reading these papers. Everybody wanted to go home. Uh, they, they didn't want to pay attention to those papers. Anyway, so Brown is very much involved, not just in Brownian motion, but with, uh, he would have probably been horrified to see Brownian motion used as a model in phylogenies because uh, I don't believe he was a, an evolutionist. Um, okay. Um, we're, we have quantitative characters controlled by multiple loci. And uh, the processes that we can think of that will change these quantitative characters include, um, let me try the other one and see if that works. Um, if I can figure out which button to push, oh yeah include genetic drift of the alleles involved in controlling, in, in uh, contributing variation to the characters, including mutation to new alleles, so drift of existing alleles, occurrence of mutations and subsequent drift, also variable selection that might affect the frequencies of individual genes. The gene may contribute to character X, but for some other reason it's under natural selection that may vary through time. We're generally most interested in natural selection that will be different in different lineages, otherwise everything will just change in the same direction and there won't be any uh, differences generated between species. Uh, but also, we're, Steve particularly has focused on this and I think it's appropriate, um, selection where the fitness is based on the particular phenotype you're looking at, and I should add as a, a, a qualification, and a case we rarely consider but should, the case where it's not the, the phenotype you're looking at but a correlated phenotype that's under, that's under uh, varying natural selection. In this case, the varying natural selection would include chasing a wandering adaptive peak. So these are the kinds of processes that we're going to be thinking about as sources of change in lineages and different change in different lineages. Now, how does one approximate that? If you try to do it very exactly, you run into problems. Um, can you calculate, what you need to calculate when you're doing things like likelihoods or Bayesian inference uh, or even distance methods on trees, is you want to calculate the transition probability, the probability that given that you're at a particular character value now, What's the probability you'll be at some other value, at a, at a particular other value after length t of time, after t generations? And you may say, well, let's go look at the genetic drift models and say, can we calculate that? Under the right Fisher model, the standard model of theoretical population genetics, the, this, the canonical model of genetic drift, a model basically in which each offspring is the product of two of randomly sampled parents, um, and their n offspring. The, under that model, you can calculate transition probabilities for one generation, but when you go to calculate them for t generations and say, well, can we get a formula? The, the answer is really no. Uh, we can get the eigenvalues and one set of eigenvectors for uh, the transition matrix but we can't get the, uh, the other set, the transpo, the other set of the, the eigenvalues, uh, and we don't have expressions for these. Well, you can um, alternatively, let me do this a little out of order here, you can look at diffusion approximations, and there's some, a very elaborate work by Moto Kimura early in his career uh, in which he got polynomial, you know, power series of polynomial, of Gegenbauer polynomials and things like this for transition probabilities. And they can be computed that way, but it's very tedious uh, mathematically and numerically. Um, and that's for not for the exact right Fisher model, but the diffusion approximation. But diffusion approximations are, are very good, and so that would be good enough for us, but we still can't, we can't do that in any practical sense. 
You can do it numerically by making big transition matrices in the computer and powering them up in the appropriate way. Uh, solving, you can get eigenvalues and eigenvectors numerically, and then you can put together T generations from now. It's, it's a kind of a pain, but you can do it. However, none of those is really easy, simple uh, methods. So people have looked for approximations, and the people who introduced the central approximation that I'm going to talk about here uh, were these guys, Luca Cavalli Sforza and Anthony Edwards, who's shown in both pictures. Uh, Luca Cavalli, they were both, in one way or another, students of R.A. Fisher. Um, Luca had finished his work, he, he did actually pioneering work in bacterial genetics. If anybody is a bacterial person, you may have heard of the HFR recombination system. Anybody heard of that one? A few, few heads nodding. Luca. It, it was, it's invented by Luca, it was discovered by Luca in the 1950s. But he ended up being interested in human population genetics and going to a professorship in Pavia and Anthony Edwards um, joined him as a sort of postdoc junior researcher there in the, early, in the late 50s, early 60s. And they were working on differentiation of human populations and they were using blood group gene frequencies. They started thinking about the statistical treatment. It's a long story, but basically they ended up saying, well, they're varying on a scale. Um, it's not Brownian motion. Um, it, it's not a simple uniform random walk. Um, it has problems that it's more variable in the center of the gene frequency scale and less variable out at the edges. But just to get an approximation, any old approximation, let's assume that the variance of gene frequencies at point P on the scale is not this formula, which is a parabola, but is roughly constant because we'll, we'll say we're interested mostly in small changes and therefore we can treat it as constant. It's a, uh, a dubious approximation, but they made it and it's been uh, quite successful in, for that and other purposes. Um, if you look at, I should say that their work went on to try to make phylogenies, to try to come up with numerical methods for phylogenies. They were pioneers in this. And the first project, the project they did, they invented a method of tying together um, gene, f going into a gene frequency space and tying populations would then be points, tying them together by a tree of minimum length string which as far as I can tell is the first parsimony method in phylogenies. Luca also had a distance matrix method of where you got the tree that predicted best the table of, of distances. They, they did pioneering work in genetic distances as well. They were at an impasse which of these methods um, was the correct, me was the best method to use so they both were, were um, students of R.A. Fisher and they said, well, there's Fisher's great method of maximum likelihood. Let's figure out what a maximum likelihood phylogeny method would be and see which of these two it was. And they figured it out and it wasn't either of them. They published a paper in 1964, another in 1965, describing the parsimony method and describing the likelihood method. They didn't describe the distance method till 1967 and, and Walter Fitch had by then published his distance method. But in this project they invented the first parsimony method, the first likelihood method for phylogenies. No, I did not invent, apply, I was not the first person to apply likelihood to phylogenies. They were. And the f first distance matrix method, they were at least tied for that. So it's an amazing paper really founding uh, the statistical methods for inferring phylogenies. But in it, they had this Brownian motion. Um, and what I want to do here for a moment is just do a little, show you a few numerical calculations to show you whether or not this works. And then we'll talk about how we get from the Brownian motion to, um, <coughs> to quantitative characters. Right now, we're just talking about a gene frequency. Here's a gene frequency scale from 0 to 1. This is a plot from R. Um, we start with the gene frequency of 0.5 and we go forward 10 generations and we make the big transition matrix and we power it up to the 10th power. And then, we s and then we look at one column of it and it tells us what's the probability of being in each of these gene frequencies. You start in the middle um, and 
it spreads out into this rather Gaussian looking distribution. Now under Brownian motion, after t unit t t of time, you are distributed in a in a perfect normal distribution whose variance is rising linearly with time. So it's standard deviations going up as the square root of time. And here it's pretty close to that. In fact, if you do the calculation with normal distributions and figure out how much of it is in each of these classes, you see the circles. So it's close. It's not bad. For that case, that's starting right in the middle and going for uh, 10 generations in a population. This is a small population of size 50. Um, if you want to work with a million individuals, you have to have a million by million matrix, so we can't, can only make it so big. Here is after 50 generations. The normal distribution, the purple circle, spreads out. Um, it goes beyond the end of the scale, but I've aggregated the stuff that's sticking out to the right, so the last class is it's, it's up here. Here is the powering of the, of the more exact information of powering up the matrix, the transition probability matrix of the right Fisher model. And it's sort of good. You can see there's more stuff out here than the, the normal distribution predicts, and the, it's a little bit off in the terminal classes. When you calculate transition probabilities, you don't do this aggregation part, so you don't really use the stuff out here anyway. It, it's kind of getting a little crappy at this point. Um, if we start at a, a different frequency, point 0.1, so we're not in the middle of the scale, we're starting out at point 0.1, and you go forward 10 generations, then you'll see the normal stuff is here, and here are the actual numbers. Um, you'd look at that and say it's not really a very satisfactory approximation. Something, things are going wrong. The end, the fact that change is slower at the ends of the gene frequency scale um, is starting to tell on the, on the ability to describe this as a Brownian motion. But we're sort of stuck with Brownian motion because it's the one for which we can calculate transition probabilities and it, everything else is either, it's either impossible or unbearably tedious. Um, let's see, yeah, here we go after 20 generations in starting from point one, and again, uh, less, you, you, you wouldn't really describe that as a, good, as a good approximation. Okay, so we can sort of describe, but with limits, um, the process of change of gene frequency under genetic drift as long as it's somewhere in the middle of the scale and doesn't go for too many generations. That's the, uh, the rough rule. So what about quantitative characters? Well, suppose we have the, the, Fisher -Wright, the Fisher model that I described in the first lecture, and we uh, make the quantitative ca character a sum of contributions from a number of loci. Now you recall that that was the model, but I'm covering up one, one difficulty. Oh. If the individual lo uh, locus gene frequencies have their change approximated by Brownian motion, if each of them is drifting, and they're, say they're unlinked, so they're essentially drifting uh, independently, um, then if the phenotype were just a linear combination of the gene frequencies, a weighted sum of the gene frequencies, it follows that if Brownian motion does a good job for the individual gene frequencies, then Brownian, then it'll be a, a scaled Brownian motion that you will have for the character. And that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Well, however, I was ignoring dominance. Dominance means that the contribution to the phenotype is, is a quadratic function of uh, the gene frequency. Then it individual Brownian motions don't lead exactly to Brownian motion. So to the extent that dominance is a big deal, um, that, that starts to create departure from this. Epistasis can cr cause even more trouble. Uh, I think, and um, so it's a, it's a model with limitations. I think I was the first person to suggest that you use Brownian motion for quantitative characters is just a direct extension of what Edwards and Cavalli-Sforza were, were going to do. 
And Anthony Edwards is very clear. He said, well, we would have said that. And, he, you know, we, we would have said that very soon, but I, I, got, it. I got there first. Um, so we're sort of thinking about genetic drift. We're getting some kind of approximation by Brownian motion. But there's also the issue of mutation. Uh, all of what I'm talking about is just change of the two alleles under genetic drift. What happens if new alleles keep popping up and you're basically, the space you're in keeps expanding because new alleles come along and there's another dimension and you're, you're going to start, uh, those gene frequencies are going to start uh, uh, changing. Well, we don't have any good analytical results showing to what extent Brownian motion of the final character is affected by this, but I would guess that I would actually guess that it would improve our ability to model by Brownian motion, but that's just a guess. Uh, basically hasn't been worked on. Um, you can make models of mutation on a, on a scale of contributions by that, uh, by that gene. You can model them as a sort of random walk there is the problem that if you're in a character where there's a limit to the character so that you can, you can change the phenotype up to a certain limit and the developmental system is not, is not going to tolerate going beyond that. Um, if you have that sort of situation, then as the, the allele that you have gets out here, more of its mutations will be downwards than upwards. Um, Adam Jones was using a model in which the um, effect of a mutation was symmetrical. Uh, was, was its mean effect was zero. When you're out at a limit like this, you should not have a model that has a mean of zero. It should be biased o downwards away from the limit because there's more ways to, to basically a well-tuned system has more ways you can, you can make it worse than make, than make it better. Uh, and so that will create, uh, that, that will be what you'll have to do out there. So you can think of random wandering on the allele scale. There's also the changes of gene frequency going on once those alleles are present. So you have to think about all of that. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all that was uh, here. Um, how about the Brown, well, if we accept the Brownian motion approximation with all these qualifications, is it tractable? If you talk to a mathematician about Brownian motion, they'll get very excited. They'll say, oh, there's wonderful pathology there. You start here, and you're wandering on the scale, and there's an early period in which it crisscrosses itself infinitely many times, and then for an exponential length of time, uh, and there's wonderful mathematical pathology to study. And at that point, the biologist should say, don't bother me with that. We can't observe that at all. The only thing that's important to us is that the net displacement from Brownian motion after time t is, is a normal distribution with a constant, with a variance that's a constant sigma squared times time. Um, and if you want to compute the probability of going from here to here on the, on the scale, that's easy. You just make up the right normal distribution and you can read off the density. So, Transition probabilities along branches in the tree are easy to do under Brownian motion. And the fact that they're approximately normal is the, essentially the only thing of interest about Brownian motion to us. Okay. Um, so as I said a moment ago, uh, for time t, it has expectation zero. Now remember that gen genetic drift the expected change of gene frequency is zero. It's as likely to go up as down. Uh, uh, that is, the mean displacement is zero in Brownian motion, ex uh, in, gene, in genetic drift under the right Fisher model, exactly. So it has expectation zero in the Brownian motion approximation and a variance sigma squared per unit time, so the variance goes up by being multiplied by time. And if you have branches in an evolutionary tree and you, you start out at a certain character value and you then change by Brownian motion along one branch and then change along another and change along another, three successive branches. The rule is very simple with Brownian motion. Uh, having it's, it's a Markov process, so having gotten somewhere, where you go next doesn't depend on how you got there. It only depends on where you are. Um, and that's the 
fundamental property of a, a Markov process. So the displacements in successive branches are independent. They start from the previous result, but the, the direction of change, there's no sense of momentum in Brownian motion. If the dinosaurs are getting bigger up to a certain point in the next million years, there's no prediction that the dinosaurs will keep getting bigger uh, if, they're, if they're changing by Brownian motion. So, okay. Uh, now, let's think about, here come the trees. Uh, Brownian motion on a tree. This tree will go sideways. There's two, there's an ancestral species. There's this one. Uh, two branches take off from there and result in species called number two and three. And what we're interested in is, what's the joint distribution of these two? And the answer is, um, if you just ask what's the distribution of X2, given the starting point, it's a Brownian, it's a, a Gaussian, it's a normal distribution with mean the same as the starting point because the net changes, the expected changes are zero. And a variance which is sigma squared times the length, the time length here, and we're, we're calling that V1, the variance accumulating in that first branch. So we're, we're measuring branch lengths by the variance. And the variance here, this will be a normally distributed with mean x0 and variance v1 plus v2. Or sometime, sometimes we're using these as not as the variance accumulated, but as proportional to the variance accumulated. So it's something constant times v1 plus v2. This is also normal. So these are two normally distributed quantities. How about their joint distribution? Well, their joint distribution, x2 is equal to the starting point plus the change in branch 1, change to x1 and the change to x2. This is a similar sum. They have the same, uh, they st all start from the same point. They have the same first change here. They share that, and then they have different changes. These are simply sums of normally distributed quantities. It follows that jointly they are bivariate normally distributed, so two variable normally normal distribution. And the only thing left for us to calculate is the covariance. Now, I hope that all of you know what a covariance is. Many people know what a correlation is or think they do. Um, but I, when I speak to classes and I generally say covariance, people's eyes glaze over. I'm not going to tell you what a covariance is. I'm going to assume that you, you know that or that this evening you will rush out and read about covariances. I think, I think most of you have an idea um, that the covariance is the expected difference of the first character from its mean times the difference of the second character from its mean, the expectation of that product. Uh, well, when you do the covariance between x2 and x3 and you substitute, oh, wrong button, uh, you substitute in these expressions. The x0 is a constant and doesn't vary, so it, it drops out of the expression. So you end up the covariance of this sum with that sum. Now, all three part, all three different deltas, delta x1, delta x2, and delta x3, are independent of each other. But there's this delta x1 that's shared between the two sums. It's the same random outcome showing up in both variables. And so when you, work, when you expand this, it becomes the covariances of both of these time and both of those in all possible combinations. And then you can very quickly show by the independence of these deltas that that's zero, that's zero, and that's zero. All that's left is the covariance of delta x1 with itself. Does anybody here know, who knows, what is the covariance of a variable with itself? The it's the variance of that variable. Okay. Uh, so, there it is, and you could have read it off the slide if you didn't know that. Um, okay, so it's the variance, V1. So it's the variance accumulated in the it's shared yeah. part of the tree that is the covariance between those characters. Please. I just want to make a quick comment, but yeah, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this little... I uh, can? <laughs> and I know you will. Yeah. The <laughs> what you're doing down here, this algebra, I think of that as the algebra of expectations. Is that a, you know, where you're dealing with it, the well, algebra it's expectations of, of products? Yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, there's a, ni there's a nice yeah. name for that. 
Yes. Um, let me show you then a tree, a little more complicated tree, with seven species. Uh, the blue, um, sorry, the purple quantities are the variances that we predict to accumulate on each branch. The change of character between X9 and X0, the actual change will be X9 minus X0, uh, and I've just indicated where those are. The result is that when I look at any one of these, it is normally distributed with a variance equal to the sum of V9 plus, this is the wrong color, V8 plus V1. So each one of them has a predicted variance. Um, they all have the same meet expectation, which is the starting point, x0. And now, if you work out the covariances, the covariance between x1 and x3, for example, will be the variance of the part of the tree that shared, of the branches that are shared in their evolution. And so in this case, it would be v9. Covariance between x5 and x7 will be the shared part, which is v12 plus v11. So it's very easy to read off variances and covariances, and know what the no multivariate normal distribution is going to be for those, um, for that set of tips. And when we make up a covariance matrix of the covariances that we expect, these are those quantities just read off. So that the one I showed you first was one of these, one and number one and number three. So it's this number, which is also here, V sub nine. It's the variance of the shared part between those two species. All of these are zero because those are brand, those are tips that are on the opposite side of the root from each other, and they have no shared um, branch length. Similarly, you can read these things off. Very easy to um, to set up that that matrix. It has the form of this. It's it's blocks on the diagonal within which there are blocks on the diagonal. It's a very neatly structured pattern that corresponds exactly to the shape of the tree. So the result is uh, it's a very special matrix. Um, okay, uh, here's just a picture. I'm not going to show you lots of math on I'll show you a little bit of math on, on how you get likelihoods, but I want to first show you a computer simulation. It isn't, you can't actually simulate Brownian motion. You'll be told in the next lecture that you can simulate Brownian motion, and it's a lie. Uh, Brian is going to lie to you. Uh, because it's technically an infinite number of infinitely small pieces, and no, nobody's computer budget is, is that big. So what you do is you make little normal jumps, and actually it, it, it's a sufficiently good description. So this is done with a whole bunch of little normal jumps, uh, so it's, very, it's, it's basically a discrete jumps thing that interp Brownian motion interpolates it. Here go, there's a split between two branches. There's going to end up being five tips here. Here's this crisscrossing occurring that gets mathematicians all excited and should not excite you. Um, and a net normal change, net normal change, then each of those splits, and you have now four lineages, one, two, three, that's four. It, it's a different color, but for a reason. Okay, Here, here's a lot of crisscrossing. Um, there are those four tips. Now they're different. I'm, I'm not doing it with constantly in time because different branches can have different rates of Brownian motion. In genetic drift, they might have different effective population sizes. Or if it's variable selection, they could have different amounts of variable selection. Um, and if you go forward, finally, uh, you end up with a tree where the tips are not all equally high because their, their rates of Brownian motion were different on different lineages. Now, looking at them, the first thing you'll see is, oh, they're awfully tangled. Staring at this, their position horizontally, which is the variable that we're interested in, uh, they're, they're crisscrossing a lot. They're not really retaining historical information very well. And that's true. To, make an, to do a thing like infer the shape of the tree, you need a lot of these characters. Uh, mm -hmm. then, then you can overcome that. Okay.
Now, here I'm going to go through a little algebraic uh, trickery that um, I, it was something, actually, I did it in my PhD thesis. Um, there is a simple transformation that turns out to play a large role uh, in, in all of this. You can write down the expressions for the likelihood of the tree using those covariance matrices. You can write down a big matrix expression um, for the likelihood, and you can calculate it that way, which is tedious, or you can use this trick. And the trick turns out to be very related to the comparative method stuff we're going to talk about later this morning. If you take two neighboring tips that have common branch up to a certain point, and then each of them does some independent evolution. If I take the difference between them, and I also take a weighted average of them with some kind of weight on x1 and the rest of the weight on x2, I can choose a value of that weight that makes these two things independent of each other. The difference between two tips, each normally distributed with some covariance, is itself normally distributed, and so is this normally distributed. And I can find a value of A that makes these not covary with each other, makes them independent. And the value happens to be when A, the ratio of A to 1 minus A, is equal to the reciprocals of the branch lengths. So V1 and V2 are the branch up to X1 and the branch up to X2 the variance expected to accumulate if you set up the weights proportional to 1 over V1 and 1 over V2, div basically divided by their sum, um, you'll get the right weights for these things to be independent. And when you're finished, you can show, I was very happy to find that when I took X1 and X2 as two neighboring points on the tree, and then I asked said, well, they're independent of, of the average of them. What are they with respect to all the others in the tree? The answer is they're independent of those two. So now they're sort of off by themselves, not, not covarying with anybody. And then I said, well, what about this thing? Is it, does it look like the, value, the phenotype at a tip of the tree? And the answer is it does. It behaves like a tip. It has the same covariances with everybody else and it has a variance which is equal to the variance it originally had of the branches up to that point plus a little bit. And you can, you can um, calculate that. So, in effect, what you're doing is you've taken a, a tree, and here, here we're, here's a tree with some variances on the branch lengths, and by taking the difference between these two, we in effect get a little tree of only two tips leaving behind a weighted average value here that's fictional, but it's a weighted average of the descendants. And it acts exactly as if it were a tip with this variance here plus a little, and here's the little bit, okay? So there's this neat little uh, transformation you can do in, in each variable, um, and it basically factors the tree into two parts. In what sense, the Remmel likelihoods, I, I don't want to go into the whole Remmel versus ML, um, it's not worth worrying about really. Um, the Remmel likelihoods of this tree will be equal to the product of the likelihoods of those. So you can factor things out nicely if the, if the, if the mechanism is Brownian motion, and we'll see that being used. You can use it to continue the factoring and come up with, with little two-species trees that you can quickly calculate the likelihood for. Um, and in effect, it's a transformation that um, gets you the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the covariance matrix in linear time. Time linear in the number of tips. If you have 100 tips, it'll be purport. If you have 1,000 tips, it'll be 10 times as much work as 100. Uh, many matrix people will say, wait a second, that can't be true. Everybody knows that to get eigenvalues and eigenvectors is cubic task. It'll go up as the cube, the tips. Well, not for these special matrices. They're real easy. Uh, they're, they're, they're very easy to, uh, um, to transform into independent things. Okay, so, all right. Uh, yeah, we can decompose. Um, 
Now, I want to go quickly as I can to um, multiple characters. So far, I've been talking about a single character evolving by Brownian motion up a tree. What if you have 10 characters? How will they do it? Well, the first thing is the, the m processes such as genetic drift will have the effect that they will co-vary with each other in ways that just depend upon the genetic architecture and the, if, if it's selection that's causing them to move the kinds of selection. <coughs> and you have been told about that by Steve and, and Adam. Um, that's what they were talking about when you're chasing peaks and you have the different, you have the, um, the G matrices and you have, the sel uh, you have selection response, but it's also true for genetic drift. In fact, genetic drift takes the G matrix and basically multiplies it. You, you change in directions proportional to the variation in the G matrix. Um, I'm not sure we went over that, did we? You, you, you did mention that. Okay, good. Um, okay, so the change in a branch is going to be on average zero in all characters, but it will have some covariance matrix, and the you'll be doing a multiple, a, a multivariate Brownian motion. So now instead of going back and forth on a scale, you're here in the room where a three-dimensional Brownian motion, and you're wandering in all three dimensions. And there's some kind of covariance matrix, and so you wander more along the long axes than along the short axes. Uh, so it's, that's very simple. Uh, you can go through the same math. Now here, I'm not going to go through the math, but I'm just going to tell you the result. Um, the same, you have the same structure here, but we have two characters. And what I now want to know is the covariance, not of x here and x there, but of x here and y there, where x and y are two different characters. They're not sex chromosomes, they're characters. Um, and by doing the covariances, what you will find is that the covariance of any character in one species with a different character in another species will be equal to the covariance of their change during the shared of those two characters during the shared part of their tree, shared part of their ancestry. And so we will have these, the G matrix will play, plays a big role here. And basically what it says is if, if you have a G matrix and it holds throughout this tree with all the usual qualifications, then the change in the branch of length T1, T1 generations, is equal to G times T. And the covariance of these particular two characters here will be uh, G times T1, uh, where and the particular element of G that you'll be interested in is the the two comma three element f in this case. Well, no, sorry, the X com the one for X and the one for Y. Sorry, two and three are the species, not the characters. So, so it's it's very straightforward. Now we're using in all of this the idea, and, and Steve uh, covered this rather carefully. Um, that the G matrix is somehow being assumed to be approximately about the same. And of course, that was a major concern yesterday. Um, and what you can do, you can do some math showing that there should be an equilibrium between, um, of, the G, of the G matrix in simple cases. Uh, Steve covered this yesterday. The variance of change in a character is the additive variance divided by uh, the effective population size per generation. Um, you can do some math showing the additive variance dying, d dying down as a result of um, genetic drift, being reduced as a result of genetic drift, but being increased as a result of mutation. I think this is all review, really. Um, and the result is um, that the expected that on average it should level out at, at a value which is 2n times the mutational variance. And the variance of change of the character is an interesting result. 
uh, will then be that value over n, and the n cancels out, and so it's twice the mutational variance is what, in a, in a very big population, drift will be very slow, but you'll maintain correspondingly more mutational, the mutation will result in more additive variance, and those cancel out in terms of the amount of change in the, uh, uh, in a lineage, so a big population will change as fast in a lineage as a small one will if the G matrix is being maintained by co rough, roughly constant by mutation pumping it up and genetic drift draining it away. Okay. Uh, one can do the same thing with multiple characters. Uh, that was for a single character. You do it with matrices, you get the same result. I'm going to just go on. Now I'm going to show you a, a, a little genetic simulation, a little simulation of this. Now this is actually, it's in R. It is not using those fancy animation packages, so the simulation is going to kind of jump around. My apologies to your eyeballs. Um, basically, this is a simulation with 10 loci with a mutational a mutation rate whereby you mutate up or down by one with equal probability on a scale. And there are two characters, and these characters have arbitrary, you, you, you have a set of coefficients you pick at the beginning that says what the weighted combination of those loci values is for the first character, x, and, and another set of coefficients for the second character, y. And because of those coefficients being randomly chosen from some simple distribution. I think it's an, uh, by, I think I chose them from a two-tailed exponential. Anyway, something relatively simple. Um, there will be some covariance between the characters because some of those genes will make positive contributions to both characters and some negative contributions to both characters and some, some opposite contributions too depending on the weights you choose. Well, if you run the simulation, what we'll see, we'll see every tenth generation, uh, this is on the, this particular simple-minded R stuff is on the website um, for this lecture. Uh, the weights are shown, and then you're showing every ten generations. Here are the phenotypes. We're not looking at the gene frequencies. These are predicted axes, the, the first principal component and the second, predicted from the weights. And what you'll see is these are, this is a population of 100 individuals, and you're, showing, you're seeing them all. And you're seeing in the, in the green cross their mean, and you're seeing in the purple trace that all of their past, where the mean has gone in all past generations. And what you see is you're going up towards, I think it's going to a thousand. And so mutation, the population started at, with everybody at zero and mutation has now pumped up the variation. It's reached some sort of equilibrium. It's supposed to be a cloud aligned a little more along this axis than that. And the result is a wandering. Uh, it's supposed to be a little more along this axis than that, although they're not very different in size in this case. So um, you have this, and I think if we put it, if we put this into the the, the animation machine or uh, the animation package um, that you saw yesterday, we could make a much smoother uh, plot of this. So I could do more runs, but I'm basically uh, going to be out of time. So I think I, I think I won't. So here we're imagining just genetic drift causing changes, and you get to see. And this is an actual simulation of. 10 unlinked loci and all the Mendelian stuff and recombination is all being done properly. So it's not just showing you the Brownian motion approximation. It's showing the extent to which it sort of looks like Brownian motion and I'd argue that it, it's pretty good. Um, okay, I think I will leave that and go back to the projection uh, if I can find it. And I think we're almost done. Um, so um, with selection, well, you've really been through all this. Russ Landy, shown there, um, point had, had his version of the breeder's equation. Steve has been over this. 
uh, before. I'm just using, you know, as usual, different notation from everybody else. Um, selection towards an optimum, you've heard about this, that in, in a single dimension, using a Gaussian shaped, uh, a, <coughs> a Gaussian shaped individual selection surface, uh, one, one moves a constant fraction of the way to the peak each generation. <coughs> The fraction, the fraction being, this is this g over omega plus p that you saw. It's just the same math. And you get genetic covariances out of that, but there's something else. There's another source of covariance that doesn't get talked about very much, although it's implicitly been here yesterday. If people are asked, Will two characters change in correlated ways? They often will say, oh yeah, they could have genetic covariances. Some of the same genes could be contributing to both characters. There could be genetic covariance. They rarely tell you about this one, but I think it's very important. And that's what was called originally selective correlation. I'm calling it selective covariances. It was first pointed out by Olaf Tedin, uh, who was, I think, a Swedish animal breeder in the 1920s, or a Swedish botanist in the 1920s, or he was a Danish botanist, I can't quite get it straight, was re-emphasized by Ledyard Stebbins in his great book, Variation and Evolution in Higher Plants in 1950. And that's the case in which the same, that environmental conditions m pressure you for changes, correlated changes in two and more traits even though those traits may not have any genetic covariance. So, as an example that I like to use, imagine a tree and imagine, I mean a phylogeny, and imagine two of the lineages have gone into the Arctic. And we find, let's say these are mammals, that they get bigger, they get darker in color, and their relative limb lengths become shorter. Those are what are known as a Bergman's rule, Al, uh, Allen's rule and Glogler's rule. Um, and if that happens, we might see correlated changes, co-varying changes in these two lineages when size gets bigger, color gets darker, even though there may be no genetic correlation between those at all. Keeping that in straight in your head, that we have to think both about genetic covariance and selective covariance, I think is very important, because otherwise you will just leave leave out a possibility of an important source of covariance seen in, in phylogenies. Um, Steve has talked about this. When, you're, when, when you have a population chasing a peak, uh, this is the point he made yesterday. This is my own simulation of it. I imagine that, you're, that this point is chasing a circular peak, but it's genetic. the two characters are genetically negatively co covariant. So in, if the peak is also moving, I'm going to imagine, however, that the peak is moving along this axis. Its, its wanderings are positively covariant. So this is the genetic covariance showing up in the first ten genera in the first hundred generations. I'm sorry, but if you keep going, the population it's tending to vary this way because of the genetic covariance. But as time goes on and the peak is, it's chasing a peak and the peak is going positively, things get more circular. And finally, um, <coughs> these, are, these are not a population. This is um, different generations. This means in different generations. And they are showing in the long run a positive correlation. In sp and that's because the selective covariance wants them to do that. And as Steve indicated, in the long run, in a case like this, it will be the movement of the peak that dictates. It'll be the selective covariance that shows up in the long run. Yes, Sophia. Thanks. Um, Use so the microphone, yes. I, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that seems counterintuitive, because uh, if the, let's say the peak is moving to the lower left corner, well, it's moving, it's wandering, it's doing a, a, a Brownian, it itself is doing a Brownian motion in oh, the Oh, right, okay. Sometimes going down here and sometimes going up there. Okay. Wandering okay. further and further. Okay, okay, so it's moving it moves, right. Yeah. 
Okay. It's been because it's been it, down there and it's been up there. Right. Because if it was moving in was one moving, direction, we would actually expect little genetic variation in this direction, right? Because everybody would be Well, you'd everybody mm -hmm. would be following it, yeah. but these are different generations and they would they would tend to get stretched out a bit. So you would you would expect differences still expect differences in the in the covariation of their changes. Um, and the further it moves, the, the, the more that is important compared to the, the short-range covariation, which is genetic. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I mentioned this, and I don't have time for it, so I'll just say it again. Um, if, if one trait is under selection and another one is, is really not under selection but is genetically correlated with it, um, I can show that, um, in effect, you're going to see uh, not an Ornstein-Uhlenbeck. If you have an Ornstein-Uhlenbeck process in one direction and Brownian motion in the other, um, what, you get, what you'll get out is basically a combination of Ornstein-Uhlenbeck and Brownian motion. I think I don't have, have time for this. Uh, this is the last thing. Uh, this is actually a little bit of algebra showing you the covariation of changes under the breeder's equation um, when there is genetic covariance and selective covariance, and that you, you have an expression in which they both appear. Um, so I'll just uh, say that, I'll finish up by saying that um, one one, br one research program that we could have is to follow multiple traits on, on large phylogenies. And if they are under, if they are, are changing according to processes of the sort I was calculating, nearby tips might have differences reflecting the G matrix, reflecting the additive genetic covariance plus some selective covariance things further apart in the tree might largely affect the uh, be reflect the selective covariance. That can be made more quantitative. It means that by looking at the distribution along the tree, you might be able to infer something about which, what of the, which, what are the covariances, what are the genetic covariances, and what are the selective covariances. There is hope of doing that, but better yet, if you can do uh, infer genetic covariances independently by doing breeding experiments. You can't if you're working on blue whales, but you can if you're working on, on Drosophila uh, or mice. Um, then you would have a, an outside set of information about the genetic covariances and from either this stuff using close and far tips or and or the genetic experiments you have a hope of back calculating what the gen what the selective covariances were, which is something that would be of gr I, I think would be of great interest to anyone working on um, covariance c correlations in evolution. I don't know of any more direct way of of uh, figuring out what the selective covariances are, it, unless we have a very complete understanding of the way the ecology works the way the characters uh, interact with it. But, but there are these hopes of these more indirect ways. Here's some references. These are some ones on the difficulties of calculating, uh, of doing exact calculations with genetic drift. <coughs> Edwards and Cavalli Sforza on their stuff, my, me on um, applying it to, uh, this is the first paper that I published that mentions the, the extension of the Brownian motion to um, quantitative characters. Here's a more exact coalescent based um, calculation of transition probabilities uh, in uh, uh, gene frequency change with without mutation. Um, and then the stuff on likelihood on phylogenies and the factorization. Um, uh, Elizabeth Thompson, who's at our my university, was working then as Anthony Edwards student in Cambridge University, did a brilliant PhD thesis. It won one of the great mathematical prizes at Cambridge University, the Smith's Prize. And, and as a, one of the rewards for winning it is that you get published, you get your uh, 
it published as a book, so there's a very brilliant monograph, difficult but brilliant monograph, Human Evolutionary Trees. Um, and here is a later, what is this? You know, I've got this wrong. Uh, this was in American Journal of Human Genetics. This one is in Evolution, not American <laughs> Journal of Human Genetics. Anyway, these are some, some uh, papers where I talk about the, the Brownian motion stuff. And there's a coverage in Chapter 23 um, of my book that, that is a good, a good summary. Okay. It's so, so wonderful to see you make a bibliographic error. Yeah. I mean, warms no, my once heart. Once in a while, yeah. Yes. I make them, yeah. Very nice. Thank you, Joe. Okay. We've taken, I've taken 20 minutes too long, but uh, I think we were to have um, half an hour of discussion. So we can have some of that half hour. And then I think, Brian, was you were going to start sh uh, a lab on simulating Brownian motion uh, at 10.15. Um, but we we'll can push it back a little we'll bit. We'll push that's it right. back a yeah. little from that because nobody, nobody needs to eat lunch, do they? I mean, that's, that's really, you don't want to do that. Uh, okay, so, so time to grill me about what, would you please repeat this all again and other such questions, yeah. Yeah, you can't talk to me without a microphone, as you know. <laughs> I have a, uh, a few questions. So first, um, in, in, in the trees, there are some notations, the branch lengths, some, sometimes given time and sometimes variance. Are those, um, I mean, you can, you, can, you can think of the various, the accumulated variance as a, a, an important part of a branch length, but how much of the actual branch length is uh, actually the, the, the variance that is, that is represented in your trees? But if you're if you're modeling by Brownian motion, the variance accumulated is, the is at least proportional to the branch line. Okay. Right. So and you sometimes wanted to think that way, not in terms of time, because if if the rate of change is higher in one branch mm -hmm. than another, they can be of equal length in time, but they won't be equal in, in the accumulation of the variance and predicting what where the Brownian motion will go. Okay. So then um, looking at the at their, the the math involving transforming a node into a leaf, uh, I think that's like um, a recursion algorithm waiting to happen. Like it's like way well, like yeah, the perfect so case when you can do that. It, it's it's it, the the algorithm say when you use it to compute likelihoods is a dynamic programming algorithm. So and and it and it is imp of course implemented uh, recursively. It al always has been. So like can you can you use that? Um, that structure to given a tree of um, of uh, but like a well not necessarily a species tree but given a tree, can you use that um, that process of burning motion in traits under drift to test how much departure I mean how 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 those how those calculations from the trait departure from drift so in other in other terms how the branch lengths change uh, so that you can test how drift those traits yeah. are. You, you could in principle, mm -hmm. you can in principle, and you will see it done here in the course, because later on you're going to be, s I mean, we're, we're headed into a part of the course where you're going to be told a lot about also ornstein uhlenbeck processes and issues like uh, testing for changes of, so of, uh, of the amount of, br of the rate of Brownian motion in different parts of the tree, or in the ornstein uhlenbeck process, testing of shifts of peaks in different parts of the tree. So now the question is, where'd you get the tree? And the answer these days is molecular data giving you, are, are giving you the tree. In, in the case where anybody does this, they take a molecular tree, and then you could sort of map the characters onto it. I should say that back in the 1980s, uh, when morphological systematists were somewhat resisting using molecular data, there were whole symposium volumes on which is better, morphology or molecules, for inferring trees? That's come to be seen as silly, simply because the volume of, of molecular data is so much greater uh, that, that it really is not much of an issue. Almost nobody uses the morphology to get the tree when, you, when the molecules will give it to you so much more precisely. So now our interest in, um, in doing these models, our interest is not to get the tree, but to use the tree to find out about the covariation of the characters, find out about changes of mechanisms, find out interesting things about, interest, uh, about characters that are of interest to us.
Um, so yeah, you're, you're headed into days and days of worrying about issues like this. So. <laughs> If you could go back to slide uh, 15 uh, with a okay, you matrix can all cover of your eyes. I'm looking down here to see when I get to 15. There we go. Yeah. That one? Yeah. Um, so when we talk about variances for for the tips of the trees, yeah. uh, of the tree, so yeah, this diagonal terms, um, I think uh, this th there might be a bit of a confusion um, here, and I just wanted to check if I understand it right. So let's say we, we talk about the, the V1 plus V8 plus V9, um, so the variance of uh, X1 um, from the previous slide. So this is the variance understood as an expected uh, square departure from the, from the root. Right. Well, it's, it's not from it from the from the e from its expectation, and its expectation is the root is value the root. because right. the expect expected change under any Brownian motion is is zero. Right. Yeah. Right. So this is um, because it's, it's the predicted. It's the it's the it's not the empirical variance. Exactly. It's the it it's the variance under the model. Exactly. So it's a, it's a sort of a phylogenetic variance, if you let you can, you call can it that. term, yeah. it, term yeah. it. So anyway, it's not the variance in a trait in the species X1. It's it's no, and it's not a within yeah. population exactly. variance. It's a yeah. variance of the net change since the bottom of the tree. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. you know, you don't you don't get to see that, but you do get to see the differences between the tips, and they are a consequence Indicative of that. that. Yeah. They're affected by that. And you can see here, uh, uh, just to, to re-emphasize, let's take this one, uh, species 5 with species 6. I think that's what that is. Yeah, here and here, it's V12 plus V11. Now let's see if I got that right. Yes, I did. There it goes. You just read it, read it, read the common part of their shared evolution off the tree. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to emphasize that we're not talking about variance within and we're not talking about a variance that's every time seen empirically, of course, the outcome is noisy and, and it's the net change, the variance of the net change. 